10 miles from Cardiff city centre, in the small hamlet of St. Lithens, stands this imposing Neolithic structure. And just a mile away, the Tinkinswood Chamber. Both are thought to have been built around 6,000 years ago, predating Stonehenge by a millennium. In this video, we'll explore the folklore and legends that surround the site, and then delve into the research and excavations that have taken place. Chapters are down below if you'd like to skip ahead. And as always, let us know what you think in the comments. This cromlech, now commonly known as St. Lithens, or in Welsh, Cloyna Lithon, was once called Mycephelin, and also Gwalafiliast. Mycephelin translates from Welsh to the mill field. Some suggest this relates to the legend that on Midsummer's Eve, the capstone of the dolmen spins three times, then goes to the nearest river to bathe, a legend associated with other dolmens, such as Mine Ketty or Arthur's Stone on the Gower. Gwalafiliast translates to the lair of the greyhound bitch, or simply the greyhound's lair. This name is also given to a handful of other dolmens in Wales, and has several theories around its origin. Coridwyn is the goddess of transformation, rebirth and inspiration, and possesses the cauldron of poetic inspiration called Arwen. In Prethai Anulven, the old Welsh text recounts the legendary King Arthur's expedition to the Otherworld, where he hopes to steal the Holy Grail, often interpreted to be Coridwyn's potion. In the tale of Taliesin, Coridwyn set to brew in her magical cauldron, a mixture that would grant the gift of wisdom and poetic inspiration, Arwen, for her son, Morfran. The mixture was to be boiled for a year and a day. One day, when the brew was almost finished, her young servant, Gwion Bach, was stirring the concoction and three drops of the liquid splashed onto his thumb. He instinctively put his thumb to his mouth and gained the wisdom and knowledge that Coridwyn had intended for her own son. In his fear of Coridwyn's anger, Gwion fled, with Coridwyn chasing after him. With the aid of his new powers, he turned himself into a hare, and she transformed herself into a greyhound to pursue him. The story continues with Gwion turning into a fish and jumping into the river, and she an otter. Gwion turning into a bird, and she a hawk. He eventually turns himself into a grain of corn, and Coridwyn, as a hen, eats him. Due to the power of the potion, he was not destroyed. Coridwyn soon became pregnant, and she knew it was Gwion. She resolved to kill the child when he was born. However, when he was born, he was so beautiful that she could not do it. She threw him to the ocean instead. But the child did not die. He was rescued on a Welsh shore by a prince, and the reborn infant grew to become the legendary bard Taliesin. This is the story we often find linking these monuments to the tales of a greyhound. But what are the other possibilities? Well, on the Cadu website, their entry on St. Lithens says, Despite its Neolithic origins, the site's name may derive from the Arthurian legend of Cullach and Olwen, which appears in 14th century texts. In the tale of Cullach and Olwen, in order to win Olwen's hand in marriage, Cullach must complete 40 impossible tasks, set by Olwen's father, Asbathaddon, chief giant. The first group of tasks require preparation for the wedding. The second group is to make Asbathaddon presentable to his guests. To cut his hair and to shave his beard, he requires comb, scissors and razor. These items are located between the ears of Tush Truth, a king who has been transformed into a huge boar with poisonous bristles. The hunting of this boar cannot be accomplished without obtaining a whelp, a leash, a collar and a chain, along with the best hunters in the land, Mabon son of Mordron and Gwyn son of Nuv. The hunting of Tush Truth is the pinnacle of the tale of Cullach and Olwyn, and the oldest Arthurian tale. The boar hunt also appears in the Mirabilia, List of Wonders, attached to the 9th century Historia Britonum, and a possible 7th century poem attached to the Ugathodin. The two whelps that Arthur's group must obtain are the puppies of Gast Rumni, the bitch of Rumni, and they are named Gwithrud and Gwithne Astrus, the next task is to obtain a leash made from the beard of Dillus the Bearded, as nothing else will hold these two whelps. 
Arthur is told that Gastrami is in the form of a she-wolf with her two cubs, in a cave at Abaclavith, the mouth of Avon Clevi. And when they find her, Rami and her cubs were changed into human form. Most explanations for this strange episode suggest she was a human princess turned into a wolf for her sins. However, these links to this site may be a later addition, as the hunt for the Tuch Truth is generally thought to have been in Pembrokeshire. In the book Folklore and Folk Stories of Wales, Mary Trevelyan argues that these megalithic monuments were named in Caridwin's honour as a canine symbol. She also talks of the Cun Anun, the dogs of the Otherworld. These hounds belong to Araun, the king of the underworld, and are said to haunt the hills, ravines and woodlands. In Welsh folklore, these dogs, when heard howling, prophesize disaster and doom to ancient families and to the peasantry, misfortune, calamity or death. Heard singly, the dogs always denoted sickness and death. In the Vale of Cloyd, an Englishman was nearly killed by the Cun Anun and made his escape from Wales, saying its demons were the curse of the country. She also goes on to say that all the dreary valleys of South Wales were supposed to be haunted by these hounds. A Breconshire farmhouse is frequented by a white Cun Anun that mysteriously comes and goes before a death in the family. In Cardiganshire, a brown creature of the pack with white ears is the bringer of evil omens, while in Carmarthenshire, a grey hound appears to be the favourite. As you can see, stories relating to magical hounds abound. Let us know what you think in the comments. Although sites such as these are thought to be many thousands of years old, it's common for them to have names linked with legends from more recent times, such as those linked with the Arthurian stories. But these tales often have similar versions told in different cultures across the world, so we really can't say how old the origins truly are, or how they may have been mistranslated and interpreted over time. There is another tradition that says the field in which the stones stand is cursed, and that nothing will ever grow there. The stones themselves were also believed to grant any wish whispered to them on Halloween. While researching this tradition, we noticed a lot of websites that say the following. The Cromlech stands in a field known as the Accursed Field, so called due to its supposed infertility. However, Julian Cope, the modern antiquarian, has suggested that the name may have derived from Field Ocour. We aren't quite sure what this means. But coincidentally, yesterday, Julian Cope himself shared one of our photos of this Cromlech on his Facebook page, so we've left a comment asking if he could give us any more info, and we'll pin it in the comments down below if he does. You can also find a link to our Facebook in the description, and follow us on there for regular history and folklore posts. According to Kovlin, the site has been described and assessed since 1874, but not properly excavated until more recently. In 1875, human remains and coarse pottery were found in the debris thrown out from the interior. Toby Driver writes that severe erosion by cattle in 1992 led to the exposure of subsoil cairn material within the chamber and on the north side. This led to the chance discovery of surface finds of a fragment of polished stone axe and several flint flakes. These joined a fine leaf-shaped flint arrowhead found independently in the same erosion feature and placed in the National Museum of Wales, Cardiff. The finds were published in the Archaeologia Comprensis 1992 and constitute a significant addition to the poorly recorded finds noted by Lucas in 1875. Following the discovery of these finds, conservation was carried out on the badly eroded tomb with soil and turf replaced to cover the exposed areas. Excavations were then planned and carried out as part of a community archaeology project at Tinkinswood and St Lithans during 2010 to 11. At St Lithans, there was a small exploratory excavation to determine the length, depth and breadth of its mound, and to see if any features of a forecourt survived with any datable material. On their website, linked below, Bryn Kelly V Archaeology go on to say that while Tinkinswood had been subject to an extensive excavation in the early 1900s, St Lithans has never been scientifically explored, although the chamber had been cleared out in 1875 and some records made of its contents. Bone, struck flint and pottery were recorded amongst the chamber contents, 
and further finds of struck lithics and a polished stone axe fragment were made in the 1990s during works to consolidate the monument which was badly eroded. The results of the excavation showed that the monument measured 30 metres in length from the easternmost edge of the exposed façade to the western edge of the Long Cairn and was approximately 12 metres wide. Three structural elements of the monument were identified, a long cairn, a possible structural earlier round cairn, and a forecourt façade. Whilst excavating the collapsed façade material, pieces of grooved ware pottery, struck flint and a fragment of bone needle were recovered. It was humbling to see that four courses of intact façade were preserved beneath this material. The size and extent of the façade were not established during the excavation, However, it does not appear to be a deep U-shaped façade comparable to that at Tinkinswood, but rather a shallower, more open façade, possibly with splayed horns. What is really useful is that we now know that it did have a façade, and might well have resembled its big sister. Thanks for watching, and we really hope you enjoyed the video. We've got another two videos nearly ready to upload, one where we revisit Tinkinswood in a little bit more detail and another where we explore Gorsefower Stone Circle, Beth Arthur, and the Monaclog V area of the Preselis.